Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31. The title for the sermon is Deliberate Sin. To go on sinning without repentance is a scary thing. Four take-home points from a Reformation Day sermon. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversary. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of God? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Father, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for bringing us here together to sing hallelujah together, to praise your most holy name, to be ever thankful for your goodness to us in Christ Jesus, to praise God there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I pray this morning as we have gathered together in the name of Christ that we would continue to worship in spirit and in truth just as we have in song. Now may we also in Your Word, a hard word, but may we worship You nonetheless. Draw us near, Father. Bless us as You do. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. So it's nice to be back. If you didn't notice I was gone, that's okay. Um, for those of you that did, here I am again. Uh, not quite Mark Leash, but hopefully I'll suffice. I would like to... Uh, just communicate the very simple reality that I, I love being here. I appreciate you guys. I, I, I like singing among you better than any other Christians on the planet. And that's saying a lot. If you knew me at all, heading to Laramie, that is in some measure my panacea. In some measure that's my, you know, my holy place, if you will. I love those people. I love Laramie Valley Chapel. But as I was singing, I was like, huh. People don't sing like we do. I can't hear them. I can't hear so-and-so's voice in my ear. And I sat down and I listened to the man who led me to faith in Christ preach. And while it was encouraging, I was eager to be back to you. And so I think that is important for me to communicate to you that amidst all of the burden that I carry and the busyness that I have and the sometimes... Uh, maybe not seeming like I'm available for all. The fact is, I love you guys, I appreciate you guys, and this is my spot. So, glad to be here. The next thing that I wanted to get to is, I've had multiple of you over the week, and I received a text message this morning, kind of communicating the same ideas of, what should our part be in Halloween? And so I'm like, you know, I say a lot of things a lot of times. I forget where I say them, though. All right, so I've probably communicated this in my office. I've probably communicated this in a Bible study. I don't know if I've ever said it from the pulpit, and I just I found it important to communicate this very clearly, again, so that we know that what we are doing is going to be an okay thing. All right? I don't celebrate Halloween. All right? I'm not into it. I don't like the ghouls. I don't like the ghosts. I don't like the things that celebrate the occult. I, I despise those things. However, we have sought to sanctify said day, and we have our hall festival. All right? If you didn't notice, it's not a fall festival at Risen Sun. It's a hall festival. All right? Somehow it got moved from trunk or treat fall festival thing to into the halls. And it is the Hall Festival, darn it. All right? And so, one, if 
you have a chance to be a part of it, talk to Miss Sherry. Miss Sherry's not in the room right now, but we know Sherry Dickey. If you want to be a part of helping, uh, I, I think what we need help with right now is somebody to man a room, to hand out candy, to dress up and be fun. All right. And so the way that we celebrate the Hall Festival it is uh, kind of like Doc did last year. If you remember last year, Doc dressed up as Martin Luther and he had the door with the 95 theses nailed to it. Well, it has become common amongst the church as passed by Philip Melanchthon, who was a contemporary of Luther, that back in 1517, on October 31st, Luther actually nailed his 95 theses, the 95 disagreements that he had with the Catholic Church, to the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, or Wittenberg, all right? There in Germany. Probably not, but that's what Philip passed it at. And it has been from that time till now regarded as the start of the Reformation. And so we celebrate today as Reformation Day. It is a day that we remember the time in which believers in Christ separated themselves from rank and file heresy. Now what actually happened in that day, and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, was that Luther actually sent his disagreements to the Archbishop of Mons or Mentz, as he sent that to them, that was a, an official jumping off point for the Reformation. And in case you didn't know, you guys are Protestants. All right? Um, whether you like it or not, you are. And you're like, what are we protesting? I don't know, something, usually. Uh, hopefully it's rank and file error and heresy, things that would not be biblical. All right? We are biblicists from the beginning to the end. That, that's what we gather around, right? And so if anything, this day can be a celebration where we dress up and we hand candies back and forth to one another and we sanctify that which would otherwise be uh, evil. That which would otherwise be the celebration of evil. We're not celebrating evil. We're going to come in and we're going to celebrate the Word of God actually taking over, if you will. And in some ways, sanctifying the cultural practices and mores that our current culture has. And so we're going to show up dressed up, hopefully appropriately. Um, you know, I think my kids have dressed up in some form of an old bitty. I don't even know what it is. We just have the fancy bin. And if you don't have a fancy bin, you need one. All right, we have the fancy bin. They go into it. They get fancied. They come out with pink dresses that are like this. Or uh, what are you dressed as this year, Mimi's? A maid. All right. And she looks like a Puritan maid, if you will. And, and again, cutting against the culture that we live in. So, standing against the culture, sanctifying that which would be in the culture with the Hall Festival. Hope it sticks. Hope I'm not the only one that likes that. Um, so we have our Hall Festival, talk to Sherry. But within that, I, I think this goes along with the vision of our church. And that's one of the things that I wanted to point out this morning. What is the vision of our church, right? I'm not talking about the dream that one of us had or anything like that. What, what is the mission, you could say? All right? If you want to know what the mission is on our website, we have the mission statement. In our constitution, we have our mission statement. And it is this, worshiping God and loving the saints for the fame of Jesus' name. Really simple statement, and then we have clarifying points, two paragraphs after that, to clarify what that means. This is our goal here at Risen Sun. Risen Sun ultimately exists for the glory of God. We are commissioned to proclaim Jesus, make disciples, and teach them all that He has commanded so that they may be found mature in Him. We seek to proclaim the gospel of the glory of Christ by open statement of the truth, letting love be genuine, heeding justice, and the love of God. The vision for the church is to accomplish its purpose, or these purposes, according to the ordinary means of grace, which are preaching and teaching, singing, ordinances, and prayer in a simple manner. Now I'm going to say it's a simple manner. I want to say that that's something we desire to be organic in its outflow, but if you spent any time with anybody in a church or any capacity, you know that that becomes complex. It becomes something that is actually pretty difficult. 
Because what it really comes down to is we are going to worship God together and we're a bunch of sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, put a tune to it, but it's not really a good thing to sing. But we, we are sinners and we've gathered together to worship Him together and to make much of Him together, not make much of ourselves. But what happens most often in a church? Churches are very adept at making much of themselves. We like to make much of self. And if we can't make much of self, we'll make much of somebody. We live in a celebrity star culture that likes to elevate people. We like to knock them down too. But we're not really, the church in America has not really been about the fame of Jesus' name. And what do I mean when I wrote that? The fame of Jesus' name. I want to make much of Jesus. I want people to know about Jesus. I don't want people to come up and be like, oh no, how can we ever overcome this? You know, I want to jump in with a cape on and go, it's Jesus is going to help us overcome and then fly out, right? Everybody needs to know that. Jesus is the answer. And then you need to take the effort to figure out what that means. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. So we've gathered in His name and our purpose and goal together is to worship Him, making Him known. And as we make Him known, people then become His followers. I could care less about some sort of ecclesiastical, yeah, that's a word, like dominance that is expressed by, oh, us Baptists do it better than anybody. Boo. The moment that we do that, hit me with a stick and run away. That's wrong. Who cares who does it better? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the Son of God? Do you know Him and do you follow His Word? Yes? Good. Be a disciple that makes disciples. Be a disciple that tells people that are hungry and thirsty where to eat and drink. That is our goal. Not in some sort of Amway scheme. That's how I used to think of Christianity. Amway. Or Quickstar. I'm sure there's others. Right? It's a pyramid scheme. If you get in here, and you get in underneath me, right, that elevates me. Oh, look, he brought somebody in. He must be doing good, right? And so you, you make your way up in the company because you bring people in, and that's really all you're trying to do is get people in? No. Worshiping Him and seeking to bring about the fame of His name because we've tasted and seen that He is good. We've not only tasted and seen that He is good, we've gathered together to proclaim that with one another, for one another, and to strengthen one another in that reality. We've gathered together to seek to be disciples that make disciples, to be those who are engaging in the ordinary means, because we know that sin is out there, and so is the enemy. We know that He is lurking about, seeking whom he may devour. We know that. And so we gather. We don't gather because we're trying to be perfect. Nothing in that mission statement says anything about us being perfect. We are not trying to present ourselves as better than. If anything, we're gritty and honest and go, no, we're not any better than. We're all the same. Sinners in need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior while at the same time making a big deal of sin. Why? Because sin separates. Sin separates. Sin separates in the home. Sin separates us. Sin separates. It just does. So that's actually where we're going to transition into today. The, this idea on a Reformation Sunday in which in history the Word of God was made a big deal, was shown to be super important, necessary and good and that as it was this word points out over and over and over and over again that the very reason for our gathering is to deal with sin in many ways if you remember last week go back to chapter 10 verse 24 we have this wonderful passage it says and let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day draw near, and, and so this is an admonition. Christian, stir one another up to love and good works. This is what you should consider. Think about this. How do we do this? How do we do this? 
It then transitions into the very next statement, for if that for and the if connects it back to the verses that are before it. It is a logical connective. It is not as though there is a hard line drawn there. Sometimes we treat a passage like this because it's got an indentation and it's a new paragraph in your Bible as if we've abandoned the previous thoughts and we've entered into a new set of thinking. It's just not true. For if, here's a warning based off of what was just said, so keep your mind in the area of consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Don't abandon getting together and do all the more as the day draws near. For if we go on sinning deliberately. Now let's stop right there. What happens in this passage in chapter 6 as well when we come to them? Many people want to go, well, can you or can't you lose your salvation here? And you know what? The writer didn't have that in mind. He wasn't answering that question. We might ask it, and we might be able to answer it. We absolutely can. But, but he's, he's not ans- asking or answering anything around that area. He's saying apostasy is real. Pay attention. Gather together. Stir one another up to love and good works. Because if we do not, and we go on sinning deliberately. What does that mean? To sin deliberately. It means to do it unrepentantly on purpose. Deliberate sin is not Peter denying Christ. Did he do that on purpose? Yeah. Absolutely. Three times before the rooster crowed, what did Peter do? Denied him, right? But what is the difference between Peter's denial and Judas's denial? I would say one is a deliberate going on of sin and the other is not. Both of them are heinous. One was repented of. If we deliberately go on sinning, we we have to understand what that is because sometimes we're like, oh, I've done that sin twice. I've deliberately gone on and sinned. I'm done for. That's not the case. My friend, you will be a sinner until the day you die. Sorry, I will, you will be. This is one of the reasons we cling to Christ, right? But there is a difference between being a sinner who is living a lifestyle characterized by faith and repentance and being a sinner who just doesn't care. Who goes, yeah, he'll forgive me. Yeah, don't worry about it. No big deal. And they never have the pangs of conviction of sin. They never have the pangs uh, of man. I need Jesus. This is not talking about a dark season of the soul. This is not talking about a dark time where you struggle with something. You know it's wrong and you hate it and you hide it and you want to get away from it. It's not talking about that. To deliberately go on sinning is to reject Christ and the things of Christ outright and somehow think that there is still mercy and grace. Have these people ever truly believed? Have these people ever truly grasped the hold of the mercy of God? They may have experienced some sort of sanctifying reality. But here's the warning. Here's the warning that He gives. They're one another to love and good works. Don't neglect gathering together. Because if you do so, you're going to have a deliberate going on of sin, so to speak. Connecting the two together is important and we always, almost always divide them. And we shouldn't. Do you know why I need you as much as you need us? Because I have a tendency to want to be better for your sake. I have a tendency to say no to something because of my family. What will my kids think? What will my wife think? What will my brother think? And on. Somehow we've painted that in our society as bad, and it can be. It can be when we come and we show off for one another, look at how good I am. (laughs) Ha ha! Right? That's lame. But there's a difference between doing that and actually having a regard for holiness 
because of my brothers and sisters in Christ and a desire not to disappoint or hurt. Because see, here's the thing. It's not just a matter of disappointment. It's a matter of actual hurt that is caused. Whether I want to admit it or not, my sin is going to hurt you. My sin is going to hurt you. My sin is going to hurt my family. I actually see how my sin hurts my family now, and there's all kinds of things I apologize to my children for. Oh, as I see them do it, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's for me. You're welcome, maybe. I don't know. Um, when you see them do things that is obviously leading them into difficulty, and, and you just realize that's mine. Our sin impacts one another, and I don't want to do that. Yet I do. Yet we do. Which is why we gather and sing about Christ and the redemption that's in Christ and rejoice in what He has done for us. And when we read these warnings, let them have their effect. If we go on deliberately seeing after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer, or there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a fearful expectation of judgment and the fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Oof. The holiness of God is an all-consuming So we ask, what, why preach this, right? Really condemning. Like, like this is, I've done more than step on toes. I'm taking straight up blows to your face. Right? This is harsh. This is hard. One, let it be. Let it be. I have read that things like this do no good. What good does that do? It just makes people feel bad about themselves and then they go away and hide in the dark. R- right? But there's also, when the light of this is shown, because of the fear that it brings, people repent. I tell you what, the fear of God is one of the things that keeps me going. And it is the fear that draws me to worship Him because I know that in fearing Him, there's also that great and sweet place, which is why we gather together and worship His name. We shouldn't ignore this fearful expectation of judgment and the hellfire to come. We shouldn't step away from it. Let the warning be there. But understand what the warning is. You see, all too often we do one of two things. We either let the condemnation fall fall so hard on us because we've ill-defined what it means to deliberately go on sinning, or we explain it away and it doesn't apply at all. And so we've, we've fallen under this crushing, damning, damaging condemnation. And we've failed to grasp a hold of the grace of God. Why do you think I prayed? And I'm going to finish, and I'm going to mention right now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? We have to remember that. Are you in Christ Jesus? Yeah. Have you had your Peter moments? Yes. But the call is, don't be like Judas, be like Peter. Rather than just falling under the condemning weight of your own sin and saying, there's nothing I can do. I've, I've deliberately gone on sinning. Nonsense. Why do you think the warning's there? It's a call to repent. It's a call to turn from that because you know what awaits from you for you if you do not. I would much rather, much rather be the Peter. And I tell you, I have been. And if you're honest with yourself, you have been as well. But may we, by His goodness, by His grace, not deliberately go on sin. He goes on and he gives an argument from the lesser to the greater and kind of gives us what it's like. Verse 28, Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, you might read that and be like, what? Didn't it just say in chapter 8 that the Old Covenant is obsolete? Didn't Romans say that we're no longer under the law but under grace? Aren't there multiple places that are like, you know, hey, we're not under the law of Moses anymore and we don't really have to regard ourselves according to that? Yeah, well, read carefully. Read carefully. 
Read verse 29 with it. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who is trampled? Stop right there. Gives an argument of the great, lesser to the greater. The lesser being setting aside the law of Moses. The greater being trampling underfoot the Son of God. And so basically, it's giving us a statement. If you are an Old Testament saint under the Old Covenant and you put aside the law of Moses, what did the passage, passages in the Bible say was going to happen to you? Well, based on the evidence of two or three witnesses, they'd take you out back and stone you. All right? And there's multiple passages that give that idea. That immediate death and judgment from the community is going to come to you. Now, with that being said, is it saying that we're under the law of Moses? No. Is it saying if we put it to the side that, that somehow we're going to fall? No. It's a comparison. And the comparison is how much worse of punishment is coming to those who do what? Well, to the one who tramples underfoot the Son of God. Failing, failing to engage in the ordinary means of grace and seek a lifestyle characterized by faith and repentance is a trampling underfoot of the Son of God. It's taking for granted Jesus and what He's done. What has Jesus done? Well, Jesus died on the cross for our sin, right? He went to the grave. He rose from the grave, right? And how many times have I heard people mockingly take the name of Jesus on their lips? I'll tell you, one of them is a comedian that our nation loves and the people quote makes me angry every time I hear it. Will Ferrell. Oh, baby, Jesus saved me as he's walking around. Oh, it's Invisible Flames. You guys know the movie I'm talking about. Some of you do anyways, and you shouldn't have watched it just like I shouldn't have. But how easy does our culture take that slanderous usage of Jesus on their lips? Always, always, they mockingly say, oh, Jesus will save you. They take for granted the grace of God, thinking that somehow they're going to just get there and that they can do whatever they want here on this side of eternity. They have taken grace and they've defined it poorly. They've taken it and bastardized it, made it to be something it is not. And here it's like, no, no, no. How much worse of a punishment is awaiting the one who is trampled underneath their feet, the Son of God? He says, I don't need to repent of sin. I don't need to repent of my sin. I don't need to worry about anything. I'm going to get to go to heaven. Over and again, through the years in the church, I have discovered people that have an assumption of their salvation and they know not Christ or the things of Christ. And, and that is a serious thing, my friends. I have sat in homes and asked for testimonies of salvation before, and there, there is no testimony. I walked the aisle, prayed the prayer, took the preacher's hand. Okay, well, what would you say in that prayer? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Like, how do you not know? I mean, even give the Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins thing, and we can work with it here, folks. But if, if you just kind of got baptized into religion... If you don't understand what you're being saved from and how He has saved you, then what have you done? You're just a religious attendee. That is a trampling underneath the feet of the Son of God. That is profaning the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace. How are they sanctified? Very simply, just, just put it as simple as we possibly can. You can enter into a religious circle, you can enter into a group of Christians, and you're going to benefit from those Christians. It might not be financially, because you can enter into a group of pagans and benefit financially. I talk about there's a particular benefit that the grace of God has on individuals' lives. Here's one of them. You enter into a group of Christians, and I've worked for unbelieving work crews and believing work crews. If you've ever been on the construction site around a bunch of unbelievers, 
It is horrible. There is profanity, there is obscenity galore, and there is a blame shifting that happens like this. Everybody's trying to cast blame on somebody else. You can't, I mean, I had to start painting my tools. I had to paint all my tools white and then got made fun of. Oh, is that a sign of your virtue, Johnson? No, it was just the color that was in the garage. And so I painted my tools white so they wouldn't get stolen. So when I'd see somebody's tool with orange painted on top of it and white underneath it, I'd be like, I know what you're doing. That's mine. There is a particular stress. There is a particular difficulty. There is a particular thing that the people that we work for, they didn't like having us there. They didn't trust us. Now let's go to the Christian crew. Christian crew where there was five of us that were believers. If there was any profanity, we corrected each other. We very often started the day prayerful. There was always a forgiving spirit and attitude amongst the group. Not always. I mean, we shatter struggles, but mostly it was quite pleasant. The being mad at everything. I remember one time we had an inspector show up, and he goes, I don't like the way the backside of that building looks. Cut it all off. And we're like, we've already roofed it. We put roof on it. We've had soffit, fascia. And he said, I don't care. It doesn't meet code. Cut it off. And we went, all right. Are you kidding me? How many other crews would that have ended up in like fist fights? And we just said, you got it, boss. Cut it all off. And had a great time doing it. What explains that? Jesus, right? Jesus explains that. There is a sanctifying effect that comes about even in groups of people where unbelievers enter into that believing group. And so they've experienced the goodness of God. They've tasted those things. And yet, And yet, they've walked away from it. And yet, they've trampled on, profaned, defiled the blood of the covenant by continuing on sinning deliberately, intentionally, without any remorse, without any action of of guilt or conviction. You may not like the guilt, you may not like the conviction, but thank God for the conviction. Thank God for that. Because if you coldly, calmly had no conviction, the Spirit of God is not there. Don't quench that convicting voice. Don't put it out. Don't put it out. Listen to it. Hear what it has to say. Repent. Why? For we know Him who said, Now he's quoting from the Old Testament, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. This is our God. We were spending time in Isaiah in Sunday school. And in Isaiah, it's a beautiful, beautiful book that is full of the vengeance and recompense of God. But it is also full, full of the mercy and grace. Calling people to repent. And again, the Lord will judge His people. God will judge. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Here's the thing that I believe we fail to get. Our God is the living God. Not just a living God, like I wrongly said when I read it. The living God. He is alive. He's not dead. Jesus went to the grave and He rose from the grave. Amen? He is the one and only who's alive. When you compare Him to any other gods, they're all dead. All of them lay in a grave. All idols fall every time. Not him. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The God who is there and the God who cares. The God who says repent and believe and follow me. The God who is holding his hand out, seeking to give mercy and grace. Take it. Grab a hold of it. Follow after him. This is what the call is. Don't throw that away. Don't let the world talk you into something. Don't let your own flesh and the enemy tell you that there's no point to all of this. Don't let the the doubts that enter in, because there's so many points in this sermon that you could enter in and go, yeah, but, yeah, well, you don't know. Well, look at the judgmentalness of this. 
What am I supposed to do with that? Take that home to my friends? I don't know if anybody in here sounds like that, but maybe Alan, I don't know. Yeah, you're supposed to take that to your friends. You're supposed to meditate upon it and think about it. You're supposed to seek to, to take some of these things home and have them impact your life. And so I, I actually have for us a whole other sermon, I think. <laughs> this is what you get when I take a whole week off. You get two sermons at once. Aren't you glad? You're like, no, please. I've been here for 45 minutes. Yeah. I just realized that there's a whole other sermon here. I'm going to give you these four take-homes from this because... As I engage in this, I, I really wanted us to, to really grasp why should I have a care and concern to read this, not only read this, but think this, and, and, and then feel this and apply it to myself without entering into the dregs of condemnation, without entering into the, the place of forgetfulness and pushing it off to the side. But, but how do I actually benefit from this? What do I take home? Well, four things. One, and hopefully you've already got it, is take sin seriously. Take your sin seriously. What do Christians often do? I'll, ta- I'll take like my neighbor's sin seriously. I'll take my wife's sin seriously. No, 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 no. Everybody go like this and point like this. Actually, like this. All four fingers like this. You guys don't have to do that. But <laughs> very aggressive. The five finger point. Right here. Me take care of me. Right? If you go to Matthew 7, 1 through 5, and we won't go through it because, man, that really would leave, land us there for a while, but write that down, Matthew 1, 7 through 5. In that passage, you go through, and it talks about the log and the splinter, and you hear me refer to it all the time. Do that as your homework this afternoon. And, and what does it do? It makes a big deal for four verses about you dealing with your log. Which brings us to our second point in verse 5, which is what? Then you've got to take care of your brother's splinter. Notice there I said particularly your brother's splinter. Not your neighbor's splinter, your brother's. It's important. It's an important distinction. Because I am not the Christian Gestapo. I don't walk around taking care of the sin of others out in the world. No, I have a concern for my brother. Why we want to practice membership that matters here. Because I want to know who is and who isn't. We want to know who is and who isn't. Because it'd be really weird if you've not invited me into that place and I've not accepted you into that place for me to show up and start like pointing fingers at you. And you'd be like, wait a second, did we agree to this? Nope. (laughs) My arrogance is just so much that I think I need to show up and correct everybody. Very common amongst pastors. Very, very common. Very common amongst certain groups of believers. Very common. The first, take care of your sin. Second, take care of your brother's sin. In Galatians 6, 1 through 5, it actually has that in the reverse. So if we have the idea of take care of your sin and then take care of your brother's sin, it actually has a take care of your brother's sin. And if you think you're something else, why don't you take care of your own burden? So we have a nice little chiastic structure of smacking these two little scriptures up next to each other but study that in relation to it and see how how should i regard my brother's sin and what way should i approach it? so you have those two things taking your brother's sin seriously is one of the reasons we gather together is because i regard my sin seriously and i consider my brother's sin seriously and then we consider how to stir one another up to love and good works that is the whole idea from the sermon two weeks ago The third thing to take home. This is about reaping and sowing. And you're like, well, Johnson, I didn't hear reaping and sowing in the passage. Well, take your time. Go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. And in 7 through 9, you're going to read the idea of continuing to do good, continuing to strive to do good. And, and regard Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. Consider how we may stir one another up to what? Love and good works. And so you enter into Galatians 7, or Galatians 6, 7 through 9, and it talks about not growing weary and doing good, but you're going to reap what you sow, essentially. And that is what is being played out here. You will reap what you sow. 
If you sow to the flesh, you are going to reap from the flesh. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap from the Spirit. If you sow to the gospel and the things of Christ, guess what? You're going to reap from them. The last and final. If you guys are writing these down, I'm going to give you an entire book to read. First John. First John chapters 1 through 5. The book could be labeled the marks of the believer. It could also be labeled as, as the characteristic traits of believers or the marks of a believer, if you will. It is a cyclical pattern of a life characterized by faith and repentance. So you read that in 1 John, and that is what this is about. This isn't about coming and making up some weird set of hypotheticals. Because I don't know if you've ever done this, but I'm throwing myself under the bus again. I've done this a lot. Coming to Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews 10. And I come and I study and I, and I try to figure out, where do I fit in this? Have I deliberately gone on sinning? Do I fit in this category of apostasy? Because if I have, I'm burning it down later. Oh, no, I don't. Whew. All right, moving on. How dumb is that? It's pretty dumb. If you've done it, you're right there with me. I've done that. I don't think we should come to that asking those questions. I think we should come to it and seek to take the warning for what it says and then as we come and seek to live a lifestyle characterized by faith and repentance, which is what I believe it is calling us to, that we will stand fearfully before the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Study that as well. Man, you guys got all kinds of things to study. Two weeks of study, right? Study the fear of the Lord. Proverbs is a great place to do that. Just cross-reference it. And how good and clean and pure the fear of the Lord is. Psalm 19 tells us that. How it is a benefit to us. And how the fear of the Lord leads us to this place of leading a lifestyle of faith and repentance. Resting in the fact that we have no condemnation. In him. Resting in the fact that we have been redeemed. Resting in the fact that I have been saved. And yet, even as I've been saved and redeemed, what do I do? Faithfully, repentantly draw near to so you. Brothers, sisters, by God's grace, may we not deliberately go on sin. But may we live a lifestyle characterized by faith and repentance, understanding that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this morning we've had in Christ. I pray that you would bless your word. I pray that you would bless your people. I pray that as we sing with one another and go about the festivities of the afternoon and the hall festival and whatever else we've got planned, that we would seek to honor your name. Make much of you. Rejoice in your goodness to us. Be thankful for your word. And remember our purpose as a body. We thank you for this time. I thank you for the church. I thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we all pray. Amen.